Like the Premier, I do want to um, uh, echo my condolences to the family of, of the gentleman who unfortunately passed away on Sunday from COVID-19. And I'll give an update. I want to start by giving an update on where we're at with our cases here in Nova Scotia. Uh, as of today, we have five active cases of COVID-19. Uh, the one new case uh, that was identified today is in Northern Zone and, and is a close contact of a previously uh, identified and announced case. So today we have now have 1,081 cases of COVID-19 um, in Nova Scotia. We've had 72,532 in uh, Nova Scotians tested with negative results and we've had unfortunately 65 deaths. Um, over the past three weeks, sorry, the past two weeks, we've had three small clusters of cases in Nova Scotia, all of them originating in the northern zone. One cluster involved uh, or involves two foreign workers who had traveled to Nova Scotia from another country for work purposes. These individuals had been self-isolating as required and were tested as part of their employer's quarantine protocol. So there were no, uh, no uh, exposures to anybody in Nova Scotia from those uh, two cases. The quarantine process worked as it's, uh, as it's, as it's meant to work. Another cluster involved someone who traveled from outside the Atlantic bubble to visit family and did not self-isolate. In this situation, the individual incorrectly believed that they were exempt from self-isolation, but they were not. Three other people, a close contact, and two individuals who were at a restaurant at the same time as the case have contracted COVID-19. The third cluster involves someone who came to Nova Scotia as part of their work and later tested positive in their home province. We believe that an individual in Nova Scotia contracted COVID-19 from this individual uh, and, and then three other close contacts of the Nova Scotian then tested positives. There are no links between any of these three clusters. And while follow-up work does continue and we were still uh, testing people within the incubation period of, of their possible exposure, uh, other than the two cases linked to the restaurant, we have not seen any evidence of community spread. And I want to reiterate that when we announce new cases, that we announce them, but the investigation may not, may well not be complete and, the, and, is, and is, is likely ongoing. So uh, we won't have all necessarily all the full details when we first announce a case. It can take several days before we're able to say for certain where a case originated or if there are connections between cases. And to protect the privacy of those involved, including the family of the individual who has passed away, we will not be providing any additional details on these clusters. But we thought it important that people understand the, the situation uh, of how these groups of the most recent cases kind of uh, fit together. Um, as always, public health, we will issue advisories when there is a risk of public exposure to COVID-19 and we cannot reach the close contacts directly. So as you may recall, during, uh, during one of these, these clusters, we issued a, 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 an, a, a, an advisor around a possible exposure at, uh, at a restaurant. We do that in cases when we cannot. Our first objective is to reach people who have identified as close contacts and talk to them directly. If we cannot, then we will uh, issue public advisories. So these new cases really, uh, to me, and these clusters illustrate uh, why we have to continue to be vigilant. They clearly show the importance of self-isolation and following public health directives and advice. And we have to understand, as the Premier said already today, there's a clear message for Nova Scotians. We are in this pandemic for the long haul. Uh, we have been fortunate to have a low number of cases. Uh, we've even had periods of time when we've had no active cases, but the risk uh, remains uh, to Nova Scotia. There's no doubt in my mind that we will see new cases occurring uh, periodically. Uh, our goal is not to have zero cases, but our goal is to keep our case numbers low and minimize uh, community uh, transmission. 
And we can do this by everyone following the personal protective measures, by having a robust testing strategy and rapid fall contact tracing. Um, uh, and, and that's our objective and that's what we, we have continued, we have built our response to COVID uh, from the outset uh, on, those, uh, on those core priorities. So we can't let our guard down, down. We have to continue to all practice the personal preventive measures. And if any Nova Scotians have symptoms that could be COVID-19, it's very important that they contact 811. Uh, if, you're, if, if at all possible, go on do the online self-assessment tool and get direction. But if anybody feels that they have symptoms that could be COVID-19, it's important that they contact 811 and, 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 and get direction from there. We continue to have several hundred Nova Scotians being tested every day, which is, uh, which is important. And fortunately, we continue to have a very low positivity rate, and that's our goal. Test lots of people, uh, have a low threshold for testing, uh, and, and continuing to have lots of people uh, testing negative. We need to continue to focus on, on testing as a key part of our, of our overall response strategy. I also want to emphasize that people, if, if you're supposed to be self-isolating, you need to do so. The stakes are simply too high to disregard the rules. And if you're unclear about the rules, ask and err on the side of caution by isolating while you're waiting to get the answer. I've said it before, and but I think it's worth re repeating again today that with the return of our students to schools and university, that it will be successful if we can keep our overall case count low and prevent wide community spread. We've been able to do that for the last number of months here in, in Nova Scotia. Um, and as we, but we've seen in other areas, other parts even of the country, things can change, change quickly if people become, place, become complacent. I hear that all the time from my colleagues now. You talk, look at BC and Ontario, where they're pleading with the public to not become complacent uh, because the complacency has led to a resurgence of COVID-19. So there are things that government can do, like testing university students from outside the Atlantic bubble, but there are also things that will keep cases low if we all do them together. So again, this is my appeal to all Nova Scotians to continue to take this seriously, continue to work together to keep our community safe uh, by practicing all those preventive measures, and that's, that's how we will allow our schools and our universities to open and remain open and, 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 and keep uh, and have safe, uh, ne the necessary safe learning environments in Nova Scotia. So move, speaking of the university students, last week we announced a testing strategy for post-secondary students uh, so that any students coming in to, to uh, go to university this fall uh, from outside the Atlantic bubble uh, are, are, have a number of measures which they are following. Uh, all, all those students uh, must self-isolate for 14 days, and this includes both those in off-campus and on-campus housing. And the universities, the Nova Scotia Community College, and their surrounding communities are supporting these students in this self-isolation period in a number of ways. In addition, during this 14-day isolation period, students will be tested uh, at different times. The majority of them are going to have three tests. Some of them have already been here and uh, are close to the end of when, when we started the program. They don't necessarily need, need the full three tests well, but well before they end their 14-day isolation period. But the, the objective is to have all students tested. The majority will have three tests during their 14-day period uh, when they're here. And even if they have a negative result, the full 14-day isolation must be completed. The objective of this testing is to identify anybody who may be asymptomatic put, uh, and, and they're positive, put them in full uh, isolation uh, as we do with any case and really remove them from any potential of social interaction for, for students while they might be infectious. Um, the students are also having to complete a daily digital check-in and if they don't complete that, uh, whether by text or email, uh, the university uh, will then be following up those students uh, with more direct uh, reach out. Uh, and if necessary, we can also involve local law enforcement um, uh, uh, as a supplement to the university uh, uh, actions. 
none of these individual measures, the quarantine, the testing, uh, the digital checkup, none of them are 100% effective on, on their own. But together, uh, as a combined package, these provide, uh, I feel, a strong level of, of, of safety to detect and manage cases very early on and will allow us to open up our universities the start of the in September uh, with a very low risk of COVID-19 uh, as we move into the fall in, in our universities. And this is especially important in the university sector because of the many shared living arrangements and the significant amount of social interaction that, 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 uh, that happens uh, 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 on university campuses. I do want to thank the universities, the Nova Scotia Community College and the Nova Scotia Health Authority for all the hard work they've done in the last few weeks on this. Uh, it was certainly not an easy undertaking to stand up all these initiatives, uh, but everybody's worked very collaboratively uh, to get this process operational and, and the student leaders have all uh, from the student organizations have been a big part of this as well and have uh, playing a very collaborative and cooperative role. So thank you to the student leaders as well. And I also want to thank the individual students and their families in advance for following the public health measures and doing what's been asked of them by the province and by their universities. By doing so, they're allowing themselves to continue the educa their education in a, in, a, in a safe environment. And I, I want to remind the students about the importance that they continue to do their daily digital check-in uh, as, as they're here and they share their contact information. We're happy to have students here. They're an important part of our of Nova Scotia, an important part of, uh, of, of our Nova Scotia economy and our, our, our Nova Scotia communities. But we all need to work together to, to make sure everybody stays uh, safe and healthy. And I want to move on to uh, our public schools. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion and, and a lot of questions and, and some criticism about the, the lack of a plan to respond uh, to have appropriate safety measures in our schools as well as the, a plan to respond to potential cases of COVID-19 within our schools. I know that people are anxious about return to school. I recognize and understand this. Uh, it's actually very normal given that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. But I want to be clear that we do have appropriate public health measures being implemented in schools across the province for our current epidemiology, which is a very low level of COVID-19. We also have options to strengthen those public health measures as necessary uh, if COVID-19 activity increases, whether it's in a single school, whether it's in a community, or whether it's, it's broader even across the province. So we have an appropriate plan for where we're at, and we have an appropriate uh, steps in place to strengthen the public health measures if we need to, if COVID activity increase, increases. I also want to assure everyone that while COVID may be new, we have well-established public health protocols to respond to communicable diseases like measles, chicken pox, whooping cough in our schools and in our communities. We do this all the time, every year. Um, if a case of COVID-19 is identified, public health will act quickly to identify and test anyone who may have been uh, considered in close contact with the individual who's tested positive. That's one of the reasons why we're keeping students in the in grades eight and below, uh, and even in the high schools as much as possible, in 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 limited cohorts. Uh, and so, when we have a potential exposure, we have a limited number of people that might have been uh, considered in close contact. It's also important the impact of masking, proper hygiene, and cleaning, also are important in limiting any potential spread. If anyone, whether it's a student, staff, uh, a teacher, uh, test positive, they will self-isolate at home like we do with any case, uh, away from school and childcare until their case is considered resolved. And anyone identified by public health as a close contact will be tested and quarantined then as appropriate. Will we have to send uh, classes of students home to self-isolate? Quite likely. Uh, we may even have to close schools in certain reasons. That, that's certainly possible. But I think I need to, people to understand that there is no template or a one-size-fits-all approach. There's no cookie-cutter uh, model that we follow, despite what people are asking for. Have, have, what's the plan? Uh, the response to COVID-19 and all other communicable diseases doesn't follow a template. The situation and the nuances of every situation and, and the context dictates our response. 
So the, in, any, in any particular case, the risk of exposure to others may differ, and therefore the public health actions may differ. And that's, again, why we do not have a detailed response plan pre-developed. Uh, we certainly have public health principles and frameworks and experience that we follow, but the exact response to an individual situation, whether it's COVID-19 or any other communicable disease, depends on the specific circumstances and the context of that, that individual case. One of the key priorities, though, I, think I want people to really understand is that communication to parents and families is and will remain a priority in our response to any potential uh, communicable disease uh, cases, whether they're COVID-19 or something else, in our schools. And I have to reiterate, as we're talking about schools, that the best way to protect our schools is to keep community transmission low. We need everyone to continue to follow public health directives on physical distancing, gathering numbers, masking and practicing good hygiene with frequent hand washing and regular cleaning of common surfaces. We have expectations of what's necessary in a school. Uh, that's perfectly uh, reasonable for communities to understand that. But communities also need to understand that there's an expectation of what they're going to do to help keep their students in their community, the teachers in their community. What they do on a day-to-day -day basis is a critically important to allowing those schools to operate safely. We all have a responsibility around this, not just the education system. Because we know that we need to keep our students in school, learning and, social, learning and socializing as, 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 as much as we are able to. When we announced the back to school plan, we didn't have a final decision uh, on the before and after school programs. But earlier today, we, uh, we were communicating with the uh, providers of, the, of both the before and after school programs uh, that they will be able to have cohorts or groups of, of students in their programs of up to 15 without physical distancing. Uh, and the, but they can have multiple groups. Each of those groups of up to 15 have to stay separated from each other. Uh, and so we'll be able to have uh, run by both before and after school programs, whether they're in the school or in community sites uh, in a safe manner. And like in our schools, they will be following all the other pub public health measures around uh, wearing masks, uh, increased hand washing, and increased cleaning, et cetera. We know that the before and after school programs uh, are critically important uh, and provide a, a, a vital service to families. And we need to make sure that they operate safely and follow the public health protocols uh, just as, as we are doing uh, for our schools uh, during, the, during the actual learning time for schools. I know that there's likely going to be questions about why the groups or cohort numbers in these programs are different from the numbers in schools and classrooms, the number in childcare settings, and the number in sports and recreation uh, settings. Um, it's understandable because p children may be in diff multiple different types of these settings throughout the day, each of which may have their slightly different numbers. But we have to appreciate that how the children interact uh, and, 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 and with each other uh, and the context and the environment in each of these different type of settings uh, leads to us uh, having a, a slightly different uh, a number. We've worked with uh, the people who understand those environments, have expertise, uh, whether it's in sports, whether it's in the after school programs, both within government, other uh, government departments, or in people who work directly in the, on the front line. Uh, to develop appropriate measures uh, for each of those different contexts and, and specific settings. Um, and in all of them, the, the guidelines are designed to limit the number of what we call random inter interactions between children, especially children who were in different uh, cohorts or groups. I want to move on now to talk about uh, uh, some uh, increased uh, uh, relaxation of long-term care restrictions. Uh, earlier today that we informed the long-term care sector about some additional changes. Uh, we were now going to have, um, uh, while indoor visits will continue to be restricted to one visitor at a time, uh, we've lifted the limit on the number of people that a resident can identify for those indoor visits. So now uh, a resident can have uh, there's no limit to the number of people that they can have on the list uh, to be a visitor. It's just for those indoor visits, it can only be one person at a time. 
Um, we've also now, will now be allowing residents to leave their facility with a family member to attend non-urgent medical appointments uh, as well. So those are, those are further steps in, uh, in returning the ability of residents to, uh, to have a visitation with their family as well as to have some uh, interactions uh, as were necessary out in the community and visits out in the community. I want to finish off by talking about uh, any gathering limits. Well, I said I'm finishing off. Got a few more pages here, so bear with me. <laughs> Got a lot to say today. Um, that uh, on to gathering limits. Uh, currently, the indoor gathering limit for social events, sports festivals, and special events that are run by recognized businesses or organizations is 50% of the venue's capacity, up to a maximum of 200 people. The outdoor maximum is 250 people. Again, events run by recognized businesses or organizations. For sports and physical activity and cultural events that are not run by a recognized organization, the gathering limit uh, with social distancing is 50 people, both indoors and outdoors. We now have, uh, like, uh, have reached some agreement uh, with a few facilities that will allow us to further reopen uh, Nova Scotia. We are taking a cautious approach uh, regarding the hosting of events that support both economic activity, but also is gui guided uh, with the appropriate level of public health protection given our current epidemiology. So we, are, we're, we have been working with four venues to provide an opportunity for them to host larger total groups and our total current gathering limits. Those four facilities are Centre 200 in Sydney, Scotiabank Centre here in Halifax, the Riverside International Speedway in Antigonish County and Scotia Speedway, Speedway near the Halifax Airport. These four uh, are able to uh, expand their, their gatherings uh, because they're hosting uh, large events is at their core business. Uh, they are able to manage the stringent public health criteria and they have the, 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 infra the physical infrastructure in their facility uh, to accommodate uh, safely these larger gathering sizes. So the changes for these four facilities mean that they can host multiple groups of 200 people for indoor events and multiple groups of 250 for outdoor events but only if each specific group of 200 or 250 uh, remains separated from the other group. So what we're doing is creating individual bubbles of groups of up to 200 for indoors, 250 for outdoors. And each of those groups must remain separate from each other. And as I've been working with these facilities, as I've said, they have to be separated from lineup to entry to concession to washrooms to exit. Um, and that's why there's only a small number of facilities that have this ability, that they have the space and the number of entrances, et cetera, that they can accommodate multiple groups, each group being a separate bubble, not, not being able to interact with anybody, anybody from any of the other groups. These four hosting venues uh, must submit a detailed plan for review and approval. Um, and, and that detailed plan has to spell out how all the public health directives and guidelines are going to be effectively met. Um, and, and we're in the process of reviewing those plans uh, right now with uh, Center 200 and the Scotia Bank Center in Halifax uh, as they work to be able to host uh, Quebec major hockey, uh, junior hockey games. As I've said, the plan must, it must ensure that the individual groups are kept, kept separate with signage, uh, traffic flow, uh, they're going to be delivering food rather than people going to the concession stand, all those kind of things to make, and that's what we're looking for in the detailed plans before we can give them the approval. So we, are, we recognize the need for these larger facilities, but we also recognize that we need to be able to manage larger crowds in a way that doesn't put that does it, we don't end up in a situation where we have hundreds of people who may have been exposed if we do have a case of COVID-19 as part of the audience. That's the rationale of keeping the 200 or 200, groups of 200, 250 apart from each other. It's a manageable number that we can deal with if we have to do a follow-up uh, of a case. And while their events are being hosted, there will be inspections at these facilities to ensure that their plans uh, are being followed. 
and I want to emphasize that this really only applies to these other four facilities. Uh, and also dependent on the epidemiology. If our epidemiology changes, uh, and all these facilities are well aware of this, we certainly may be backing away from this and creating the necessary level of safety based on the epidemiology at the time. So in closing, uh, COVID-19 will be with us for some time. That is the reality that we're living with this for another one to three years uh, is, is we have to be th thinking about that time frame. And while we won't be able to entirely prevent all new cases of COVID-19, if we follow the practices that we know worked in the first wave um, and have worked in the past to protect the schools and universities from other outbreaks of communicable diseases, we, we're, I'm comfortable and confident that we can keep our cases low. As a province, we have done uh, uh, so. Uh, so we have done very well so far. Uh, our cases have remained low because of our collective effort, all of us working together to keep Nova Scotia safe. But we cannot lose our resolve. We cannot become complacent like we're seeing in other in other jurisdictions. So my plea to Nova Scotians is to is to is to please stay vigilant care for each other by building safe communities through practicing all the personal pre preventive measures uh, and, and, in the, and knowing that in the healthcare system and in public health, we're, we're putting, we have the things in place to do the other components around, around testing and rapid follow-up. Those three key areas working together is what will allow us to continue to be safe.